Hi there. In this video, I'm going to talk about uh, Meta's most commonly asked interview questions. And this is actually going to be a follow up to the video I made a number of years ago uh, in a bid to try to help you to give uh, the best possible answers and to sell yourself best during the job interview. Um, the most commonly asked question in, in interviews with Meta is uh, why Meta or why do you want to work here or why do you think you'd be a good fit for this role? Okay, so how to build the best possible answer for this. Um, you know, there's various uh, examples uh, you, you might take into account or you could even ask ChatGPT to give you an example for your own role because there's plenty of information, plenty of inspiration to take uh, from there when it comes to the format and maybe a few keywords here and there. But um, another way would be something you may not have heard of yet is that um, it is in many cases possible that uh, you're not actually 100% sure you want to join Meta as of uh, as of the time of of the interview. Okay, so if this is genuinely the case, then uh, also a good idea for you would be to say it like, "Hey, I'm not sure I want to join this team just yet. I'm here just to learn more about the opportunity and whether this uh, would be a beneficial um, thing for both of us." Okay, so there's nothing wrong about being upfront about these things for this approach from a candidate. Um, so I highly encourage you, if this, is, if this is your case, to use it as well. Um, another way you'd want to pitch this uh, Y meta would be to think about uh, two elements, what's in for you and what's in for them. Okay, so try to build your answer around these two things, what's in for you and what's in for them, right? Um, the second most commonly asked question in job interviews with Meta would be to tell me about yourself or your elevator pitch or tell me about your experience and qualifications for this role or where do you see yourself in five years from now. Um, by the way, this last question, where do you see yourself five years from now, would be a typical HR question. So if you're interviewing with, an H, with someone from HR, uh, you might as well tell them uh, where do you see yourself in the next five years, even if they don't ask you because this is still music to their ears. Okay, um, now the worst answer I've ever heard of elevator pitches would be for someone to perform a readout of their CV, uh, while some of the most impressive ones were almost always uh, motivational and uh, inspirational. Okay, um, just uh, the more you work on it, you, you, you realize that it might, you might also ben benefit of introducing a, a few numbers there, a few quantifiers as well, you know, because they, they would... Uh, appreciate some KPIs as well in there. Um, or another approach you might have not heard of to build your elevator pitch would be to maybe sell yourself as a good metamate. Okay, a metamate would be, uh, you know, someone who goes well with, uh, with uh, their five, uh, or I should rather say six core values. Okay. Um, and uh, if you look at their six core values and on, on that page, you'll find that the keyword fast is mentioned five times. Okay, so this could be another entry point for you to uh, focus your elevator pitch because you basically already have the information, you already have your accomplishments, but uh, focusing on showing as a good, as someone connecting well with uh, Meta's core values can also sell well in a job interview. Okay. Um, Third most commonly asked question, what's the most challenging work you ever did? Or describe a time when you had to overcome a challenge at work. Or tell me about the time when you managed a difficult situation and what was the outcome. Okay, so this is another pretty standard interview question. It could be an example of an impossible deadline you've achieved or a critically important problem for your role. Um, the question is pretty easy to understand and to answer the challenge is almost uh, inevitably to find your best story okay and the other thing i wanted to mention here is the describe a time when you had to overcome a challenge at work is a behavioral question a behavioral question is when they are asking you for your past experience in order to enable for them to predict your future performance on the job okay and what's uh, interesting for you as a candidate from from uh, for these behavioral questions in particular is that you must uh, employ the star format to answer them Situation, task, action, and result. You might have already heard of this. What you might not already know is, is that interviewers expect you to communicate your answers, answers in a star format because uh, also because people prefer familiar approaches. They always hear answers to behavior questions in star format, but also because 
it's something that works, something that uh, employers use for a number of years. Uh, and uh, it's a highly successful method to, um, to do well, especially in behavioral interviews. Okay, so um, this would be the main thing uh, to focus on if you're just starting your preparation to focus your answer in a, um, in a star format here. Okay, so this is the challenging uh, work, you, the most challenging work you've ever did. Next one, and by the way, I'll, I'll go with more specific uh, guidance as we'll move uh, through the other questions, which are, you know, a bit, little bit more specific as we go through, as we, we advance through the list. Um, number four, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Or what's your superpower? Okay, what's your superpower? It's equivalent to what's your strength. Right. Um, this question used to be asked a lot less in the past, and uh, this is a question which uh, gets asked most often at uh, Salesforce. It's actually the second most commonly asked question there. Um, so, do you know what your strength is? Okay, because um, I found that there's it's not as straightforward to find your strength if you're only starting to prepare for a job interview. Okay, and the mistake people tend to make here is to uh, really pick something from the job description that they think would rhyme well uh, and to, to to use it for the purpose of job interview to look as uh, as someone fitting well in the job description. I believe that's a terrible mistake. Number one, because uh, that's often not your true strength. And number two, because job descriptions are, you know, oftentimes marketing manifestos these days. And so it doesn't mean the job description is highly accurate um, as well. Um, an example of uh, strength, uh, my strength, would be persuasiveness, one of them, okay? And I would pitch it uh, with an example, for example, as for being persuasive, being able to upload 200 consecutive uh, videos on consecutive days on, on YouTube, which ended up in more than 1 million views within the time frame, timeline I uploaded them, okay? So notice here the KPI in the results, okay? But generally speaking, you'd want to think what's your strength or your weakness and talk about an example here. Uh, if you're wondering what's the most common weakness people use in job interviews, it's public speaking, of course. And uh, they even uh, the employers have started to ask you for three weaknesses simply because they, they know everyone will use the first one as public speaking, right? Next one, describe a time when you faced a conflict with a team member or tell me a time when you encountered a conflict with a coworker. How did you resolve that conflict? Or tell me about the time when you disagreed with your manager, right? So... Why would I ask you such a question in a job interview? Such a behavioral question, by the way. Uh, it's because of interpersonal skills, okay? So for, um, for I, I should say, for developers and for non-managerial level roles, non-leadership roles, this would be exclusive for interpersonal skills. If you're applying for a, a very senior role, the reason why I would ask you about conflict is because they also would like to see about uh, your business acumen, your ability to resolve conflict within a business context and for a business outcome. Okay, but we'll keep it simple for now because we'll have a number of those questions a bit later on. Okay, so um, what I would encourage you here is to find your own story because the most terrible mistake you'd ever make is to take ChatGPT's story of an interpersonal conflict and uh, adapt it to your needs. This never works. Um, and um, to, to really um, think of it this way, interpersonal, uh, th these conflicts are al almost never um, ideal. You know, the, the, the resolutions are almost never ideal. Okay, so there's no problem if there, there was bits of information that, that some imperfections to your stories, if these things, things didn't necessarily go your way, even uh, after the, co the conflict was resolved, even if you were didn't end up as best friends with the person uh, that you had a conflict with, still it's a perfectly viable example. And the more realistic the example is, the best it will sell yourself in a job interview, okay? Um, the reason why I think you should avoid uh, cloning answers straight from ChatGPT is because it will not hold to, to their follow-up questions. Any experienced interviewer will, will easily read if your answer is yours or not through follow-up questions. Uh, for example, the follow-up questions could be a, what's called a backbone test. Okay, so for example, if you talk about 
a conflict with your manager, which with your manager, which you cloned from ChatGPT, they would ask you, "Hey, but are you really sure? I mean, what if the manager did this or that? Are you really sure that's?" Uh, and most of people will fail here and will uh, actually agree with the interviewer. Yes, I could have done better had I uh, essentially did the exact opposite of what I said in my original story, because you don't have, you cannot hold the story so long it wasn't yours and your example wasn't yours. So you will tend to have a, to agree with them for the sake of social cohesion, and basically it's game over because you fail the backbone test, and um, you know it won't work. So again, find your own examples. Uh, that don't, doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be yours. That's the main thing here. And of course, you know, in the star format, situation, task, action, and result. Next one: How does teamwork come into play in your current role, or what is your experience working in a team? or share an example of when you demonstrated teamwork, okay? Uh, so basically what they're asking here, it's what's the time when you, your contribution to the team made a difference, okay? This is the, this is the main thing when it comes to these questions. Um, most often the examples here will be uh, of you supporting a team member in various scenarios, you know, maybe they called in sick, maybe they were underperforming, okay? But uh, the idea is that, um, it must be you. Uh, it, it must be you. You when you played a significant role uh, that you can demonstrate. It was a significant thing you did for the good of the team. Okay. Um, some keywords you'd want to keep in mind here are listening skills and uh, a positive attitude. Okay. Maybe something interesting for you to include in your answers. And uh, um, if you want to picture yourself as someone. Um, genuinely working for the good of the team there are you know people who always prioritize the good of the group as a whole you know uh, and usually these people are not the geniuses in those teams either you know so um, you cannot have a team of a great team with only genius people you know you you can think of uh, elon musk and mark zuckerberg working on the same team okay it, it, it's highly unlikely it would it will ever work um, okay, so that's that's how you would go about uh, answering uh, questions about teamwork. Okay, for a non-managerial level role, because for manager level roles, that's your subject matter expertise, and of course, you'd want to go a lot deeper with uh, your examples. Okay, uh, next question here, uh, number seven: Share examples of how you managed difficult stakeholders, or how do you handle conflict with a stakeholder? Right, so. Um, if you remember, we had um, previously talked about a question of a conflict with a coworker. Okay, now conflict with a stakeholder. Um, there, I said for non-leadership roles, they are basically interested in your uh, interpersonal skills, and that's it. And now, when it comes to managing difficult stakeholders, you know they are interested also in your business acumen, in resolving a conflict for the purpose of a business outcome. Okay, um, for example. Uh, a colleague of, of, of yours or a stakeholder refusing to approve your bid, your offering to a customer, okay, and what you did, how you earned their trust to move on with the with the offering and eventually, you know, create business, uh, deliver on a business outcome, okay. Uh, so the keyword you'd want to take into account when building your case around uh, working uh, with difficult uh, people would be trust. Okay, trust. So that's how you gain buy-in and, uh, you know, essentially that's how you manage difficult stakeholders. And of course, you know, you could prove your point with uh, various other elements such as data um, and other stuff. Okay, so uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. Again, you don't have to end up being the best friends with, the, with that difficult stakeholder, but you must link this to a business outcome. And this is the main reason why this question gets asked uh, quite a lot, actually. Next one, describe a project you were responsible for or you led or how did the, and how did the project relate to business goals? How did you plan the roadmap and how did you respond when the schedule slipped? Okay, so um, translation here, um, what's the best story you prepared for the interview? Okay, um, and um, it's a pretty commonly asked question both at Meta but also in other companies. And um, here I'd like to highlight, you know, where is the difference being made here in in answers to in answers to this question? Um, this um, 
this is, you know, usually the leading question into a deep dive. In other words, they are trying to see on whether you actually own that story on whether you can remember all the details of that project. And uh, if that project happened 10 or 15 years ago, uh, chances are you won't remember much. From that, you won't remember some key performance indicators if you want. Um, and then the danger is that you'll be perceived either someone who didn't prepare for the or worse, you didn't own the project, okay? So that's why here there's, um, uh, there's a, um, a well-tested method to perform well in behavioral interview, that is to prepare a story bank for the interview. Uh, this, uh, this method of preparing a story bank for the interview is in contrast with another method that most of you would use, uh, that is to only try to answer behavioral questions and see on whether you could have an answer to a behavioral question. Uh, the difference between the two, as, uh, and I'm giving you this uh, sample question as an answer, is that if you would try to find the project that you were responsible for, probably the challenge wouldn't be uh, as much as... Uh, uh, remembering the details, but just finding an example. Whereas if you prepare a story bank with a story for a project you'd be responsible for, you'd want to develop even further on your story about uh, a project you're responsible for, including the follow-up questions. Even some of you will make a brain dump of several pages for that story. Okay, so in other words, you'll be far more prepared for a deep dive and you'll be able to remember far more details if you spend time to think about such a project, okay? So in other words, success in the quality of your, of your stories uh, is basically uh, defined as the amount of time you invest to develop your story and uh, of course, ultimately your story bank. So this question should be not, nothing more than inflection points uh, to building the best possible story bank that you have, okay? As compared to just giving answers to questions, okay? So this, this is the theory, if you want, of behavioral interviews. Next question, describe a time when you influenced an outcome, okay, or tell me about the time you used data to influence a decision, or tell me about the time you influenced a large audience to make a change to the business, and how did you go about providing information to justify change? Okay, so a time when you influenced someone, we talked about this previously a number of times, and there's really two things you want to keep in mind, your ability to earn someone's trust, okay, and your ability to, you know, eventually uh, to to demonstrate something on, or convince some uh, someone of something using data, okay? They they could be of course linked together, but these are the two avenues you would want to on the interpersonal skill on the presenting factual uh, information here. Okay, so again, question about interpersonal skills. Uh, we talked about this previously. Next one: How do you deal with ambiguity or describe an, uh, a time of ambiguity and how you navigated a solution that worked for all stakeholders or time when you solved an ambiguous situation, okay? So this is about uh, decision-making uh, within amb ambiguous times or with amb dealing with ambiguity in general. And uh, this uh, is actually quite a big topic in job interviews. And I want you to think about the expression, are right a lot. Great leaders are right a lot. It's actually a leadership principle for Amazon, but still there, this is also an expression in English that, that great leaders are right a lot of the time. So most of the time. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is what makes a great leader and this is what you, what you want to show during a job interview. Okay, so um, if you want an example of, a, of leadership, of efficient, uh, of what I mean by great leader, it would be, okay, Mark Zuckerberg might have not gotten the metaverse bid quite right. Fair enough, but still, if you if you track his decision making for uh, the past uh, six months or even a year during this year of efficiency, uh, he's gotten it quite right a number of times. Okay, so are right a lot. Okay, and if you're looking at Meta stock, is worth more than Tesla right now. Okay, so uh, I write a lot. This is what you what you want to show during a, a job interview. And um, these examples of uh, star answers of when you, time when you you were right dealing through ambiguity can be both positive but also negative. Okay, so some of you will like to have a huge failure with a great learning as to sell yourself someone dealing, great at dealing with ambiguity. So, um, of course, you know. 99% of the candidates will use a positive one, but if you want to differentiate yourself and sell yourself best and communication is your thing, 
and behavioral interviewing is, is a strength of yours in a job interview, you could even go with the failure story that has a great learning to sell yourself as someone are right, who's right a lot, dealing well with ambiguous situations, okay? Next one, how do you handle setbacks? Or tell me about your biggest failure or a time when you made a mistake. Okay, so question number one here is, can you talk about failure? Because most junior roles can, will have a hard time doing this. Or uh, even worse, I just, I'm the type of says that I don't have any failures. Okay, um, but the idea is that uh, it will take you a number of tries. Uh, I would say it will take you around three attempts to find the proper failure story for your uh, job interviews. And uh, if I may give you a tip here, uh, f best failures focus on learnings. Okay, I think I've said this a number of times during this video as well. Um, next question, tell me about the time when you have gone above and beyond for a client or how would you handle conflicts with clients? Okay, so of course, this for customer facing roles in particular. Um, one uh, main note here is that you cannot train or coach someone customer centricity for the purpose of a job interview. It's far more complex than that. So if you're someone genuinely genuinely good at working with customers, this would be your moment to shine if you have an, an amazing example. And this is where you can make a, a big difference during a job interview. Okay, um, next question, a time when you had to make a difficult decision or tell me about the time and use data to make a decision or tell me about the time you needed to make a decision without sufficiently available information or tell me about the time and you need to make a decision but data is showing conflicting information. Okay, so um, decision making, uh, you know, it's, it's as with dealing with ambiguity, they want to see how you decide and how you deal with, with all sorts of, of, of situations here. Um, what I found also that works best to show as a, as a uh, to, to generate tra trust in a job interview, answering questions about decision making would be to use frameworks. Okay, I, for example, type one and type two decisions. Okay, type one decisions would be the ones that are uh, where time is of essence. You must take them fast because they are reversible. Type two decisions, they are irreversible. So you must invest a ton of time in them because you, you, cannot, you cannot reverse them. A wisdom tooth extraction is a non-reversible decision, okay? Whereas if you have a project with ambiguous uh, requirements and you have to give where time is, where you have to estimate its deadline and time is of essence, maybe, you know, you don't, it doesn't have to be the most accurate timeline because it's a reverse, you could change your mind later on, okay? Depends on the project, but still this is a classic one. Okay, so uh, using frameworks uh, are some of the best ways to sell yourself as a great decision making for the purpose of a job interview. Also, you know, it cannot be another type of decision making. Common one would be a time when you had to make a gut wrench in prioritization. Again, you know, could be using a framework as well. Okay, but uh, prioritization is also a topic you'd want to, to take here. And um, the favorite test to prove your ability as a decision maker would be the backbone test. In other words, they would ask you a ton of follow-up questions to see whether you were the one actually uh, took that decision. Because what happens in job interviews uh, many times, or I should say oftentimes, candidates want to get up-leveled, okay? And for this, they use examples or they have a tendency to use it, to be tempted to use examples which they have not owned, okay? In which they were not actually the main stakeholder of that project, they were not actually the ultimate decision maker, okay? And um, this is what you want to be really careful at because this usually shows uh, in um, you, did using these follow-up questions and uh, ultimately with the backbone test. And in my experience, um, explicitly looking to get up-leveled in a job interview almost never works. I mean, the, the success I had with people getting up-leveled is when they did not expect this to happen. So at least this was my experience. Um, next one, tell me about the time when you collaborated with a cross-functional team. Okay, so um, I believe the translation to discussion would be how do you influence in a cross-functional environment? Okay, because uh, basically in a functional team, you grow your subject matter expertise. All your members of the team work for the common goal of the department you're, you're in. Um, okay, in a cross-functional one, it's more about collaboration and interpersonal skills, uh, such as influencing. Okay, so it's less about building your subject matter expertise. 
So this is how I would go about uh, answering questions about collaborating in a cross-functional team. And uh, last, but definitely not least, handling stressful situations. So tell me about the time you were stressed and how did you handle it? Okay. Um, how would I answer such a question about stress? Uh, well, basically, I failed a few startups, so I think I, I am relatively, <laughs> um, I am relatively good at handling uh, stressful situations. Uh, one fix or one approach to deal with stressful situations is to build routines or to build habits. You know, just get up and do the job, put in the hours, and then um, move on. You know, um, another way that. Uh, that's being pitched as dealing with stressful situations, stressful times, as you said, you, you can see that sports or extracurricular activities could be one of them. And uh, I believe it's, by no, it's not by mistake that uh, uh, it's, it's not random that uh, Mark Zuckerberg is becoming more and more outspoken about sports and family. Okay, I believe it's also in a bit to tackle stress. Okay, and uh, last but not least, I found that uh, one method to deal with stress, and especially with interview stress, if you want, is uh, if you prepare for an interview or if you're well prepared for, for an occasion, stress can actually act as an accelerator for your performance, okay? Will actually stimulate you for, for you to, to become the best version of yourself for the purpose of that intense job interview uh, in, this, in this case. So this would be some of the main pointers um, that I would uh, use to build my case around uh, dealing or handling stressful situations okay so hopefully you found this information useful and thank you very much for watching